Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for coming. One of the things I like to do when I'm giving a talk is to get an idea of who all is in the audience, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions. <laughs> How many of you here have never watched a Star Trek episode? Okay, decent number, decent number. I'll chastise you later. <laughs> How many of you here are not registered for the Evolution Conference, but are just here for this talk? Okay, yeah, thank you for coming. That's good, we did some outreach. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> so this talk I'm gonna give you all today is a talk I've given at science fiction and comic conventions around the country several times. And I'll tell you, I get a lot of interesting questions from my colleagues about doing this. Well, first, I often get the very snotty response to the title, which is why might you see so many humanoid aliens? It's, Isn't it because there's human actors? Yes. <laughs> but let's take a step, a step back. So when I was, when I was first um, starting to pursue this, people would say, why don't you just go to these places and just talk about biology? Why don't you just give a straight biology talk? Or why don't you write a book about genetics and evolution rather than tying it into Star Trek? So in thinking about this, we should think about like how do people typically learn about evolution? And of course, they you know, have classes in high school and classes in college. But for those who are interested after that, maybe you might watch some specials on TV, you know, a little PBS special or Animal Planet or something like that. You may pick up uh, one of the popular books that are available on genetics or evolution. So here's, here's a couple that were published just last year. OK, another audience question. Um, actually, I should point out, by the way, the Carl Zimmer book. Um, is, both of these books are excellent, but Carl Zimmer was also the Gould Award winner two years ago. So th big thumbs up to Carl for that. But I want to ask you, not about that book, but the other one, David Reich's book. How many of you here in the audience have read that book? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a decent number. Now I'll prove my point with this. How many of you here in the audience have seen this movie? A lot more. This is an audience primarily of evolutionary biologists. <laughs> Now think about if you went to the local Safeway, Food Lion, Wegmans, whatever grocery store you have locally, and you were to ask people, you know, do you know, what do you know about evolution versus what do you know about something from pop culture? Typically, they're gonna know a lot more about the latter, and they're gonna be already interested in the latter. So what I wanna do is I wanna leverage science fiction for what it is. Basically, in some sense, science fiction is a hypothesis. When you're ever seeing a TV show or a book, it's a hypothesis about the future, or about some other world, right? My goal here is to bring evolutionary concepts and evolutionary thinking to the thought questions posed in science fiction. Star Trek is an outstanding case study for this, partly because I love it, but, <laughs> but it's also great because it's a very long, very long, there's over 700 episodes, and yes, I've seen them all, <laughs> mostly internally consistent body of work, and there's very little, though not zero, there's very little just magic. They actually try to explain things in the context of science. Sometimes they do it extremely well, sometimes there's the genetic drift in the individual kind of issue that comes up. So another question that sometimes comes up when I talk to people is that people say, well, why bother discussing life on other worlds? We've never seen life on other worlds, or at least not yet. Well, in fact, this is a big effort by NASA and various other institutes to, to actually find ways that we can see life on other worlds. And yes, so far, right now, we have not found anything on some other world that is completely removed from us, that's completely unrelated. But we also, as of a few months ago, had never seen a black hole. But many of you have probably seen this image. This was on every news channel a couple of months ago. It was super popular. Now, if we were to go to some other world and actually find life, would it be, quote, life as we know it? it probably would not look like this. <laughs> so what we see in Star Trek and in most science fiction, generally speaking, is a lot of large mammalian bipeds. They're humanoid. But even look at the lower picture there. There's a lot of other life there in the background that looks amazingly like California. <laughs> right? <laughs> and the similarity goes quite a bit past just appearances that in Star Trek, there's at least 15 alien species that have produced living hybrids with humans. So I have a couple of them there. So of course, Mr. Spock being the most famous. He's a hybrid of a human and Vulcan, but there are several others that appeared in the show. That is exceedingly unlikely to be possible. <laughs> so the overarching question I want to bring today is, could we see some other kind of life as we know it elsewhere? And if so, how? 
The most logical answer to this question in terms of how is if it's not fully independent of life on Earth, that in some way it's related. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start the talk first with some basic principles of evolutionary biology, and I'm going to use those basic principles that I go over to test three hypotheses that are raised in the various Star Trek series for why you might see so many humanoid species. Now, importantly, although it's applied in the context of humanoid species, the exact same approach could be applied to any life we might encounter on another world, whether it's a microbe or, or, or a bacteria or something that looks like a fungus or whatever. So, starting on the basic principles, and uh, I know many of you here as evolutionary biologists will know a lot of these principles, but I'm just uh, extrapolating on them. All life that we know on Earth had a single origin. All life on Earth is related in a hierarchical sense. This was also depicted in Star Trek. That's what these pictures are right there. That's, uh, they'd gone back in time and it was pointed out like, look, there's the first amino acids coming together. But anyway, whatever. The details don't matter. <laughs> there's tons of evidence for this. We'll go into that in just a moment. But the outcome of this is the diversity of life we see today, which is, this is obviously just a non-random subsample. It's a little vertebrate heavy. So how did this diversity of life come about on our planet? Well. The obvious answer is the same as the title of our conference. Evolution! evolution. <laughs> so evolution has two main parts, right? So one aspect of evolution is the formation of new lineages from an ancestor. So if you go way back in time to the distant past, you see like uh, horses, zebras, and donkeys shared a common ancestor, and there are these splits that resulted in what are today distinct species. As this was happening, you also had change within those lineages. So for example, 60 million years ago, horses were the size of dogs. Today, they're obviously much bigger. 60 million years ago, they had toes. Today, they obviously have hooves. So we had change in those lineages. Today, I'm going to focus more on the left side, this idea of these splits. So yes, horses, zebras, and donkeys share a common ancestor. But obviously, trees of life don't apply just to, to horses. We can do this to our humans. This is a human tree of life from a study done in 2009. Not surprising, you see the various uh, um, ethnic groups there. You see Native Americans, East Asians, uh, Europeans, Africans. Generally speaking, with some exceptions, individuals from a given ethnic group are more closely related to others in that same ethnic group than they are to individuals from other ethnic groups. What that means is they have a more recent ancestor that is in common, more recent common ancestor. This is something I don't think anybody would find surprising or objectionable or weird or anything like that. It gets a little bit less comfortable, just in a visceral sense, when you start seeing broader trees of life. So over here now we have all the primates. So obviously humans and gorillas have a common ancestor not too far back to the very bottom of that picture. Go much further back to, for humans and say spider monkeys to have a common ancestor. Way far back we share a common ancestor with rat and mouse. How comfortable are you with the idea that you're related to a mouse? Yeah? That's good. You probably don't feel that though necessarily when you're catching a mouse in your house and you have a little snap trap like, oh, sorry, Uncle John. <laughs> Well, of course, it goes much further back than that. Here's, you know, a tree of all life. This is, uh, the, the picture is a little bit difficult to follow, but the middle is about four billion years ago, and it radiates out from there. So you see mammals, you see the radiation of mammals and their diversification. You see amphibians, fish, insects, fungi. Generally speaking, people are not comfortable with the idea that they're related to grass or to their own gut bacteria. Now, so this causes some discomfort, and part of this is because this topic is often avoided in schools. So here's some results from a survey published in 2011. Uh, high school teachers were asked about how they portray evolution in, in their biology classes. Only 28% said they described evidence for evolution in a straightforward sense. 13% spent an hour and a half or more explicitly advocating alternatives, and the vast majority just sidestep it. They want to avoid the controversy. They don't want angry parents or angry school board members or angry principals calling them up. That's part of why there's so much misunderstanding. This is also reflected in Star Trek, which hypothesizes in 2370 it's not a whole lot better. I'm going to play a little clip here. It's a very short clip. So, What is the ev evidence for common ancestry, that we are related to all life on Earth? I want to go into that briefly before we talk about mechanisms of, evolu of evolution and then ultimately to the hypotheses put forward in Star Trek. There is a ton, a ton of evidence for common ancestry of life on all Earth. One, actually, I'll, I'll do a shout out for my former PhD advisor's book, Why Evolution is True. It's a very good treatment about the evidence for evolution, but I'm going to just highlight a couple of points here. Generally speaking, all the life on Earth that we know share some basic attributes. It's all water-based, 
It's all carbon-based. It all has inheritance through these nucleic acids that you know of, DNA and RNA. What I find very particularly striking as somebody who does a lot of genetics is you basically have the same DNA code for amino acids across all of life. So exactly the same three-letter DNA sequence encodes the amino acid methionine in humans as it does in sunflowers or mosquitoes or yeast or E. coli. There's no a priori reason why ATG should be methionine, except for the fact that we're all related. So that's, that's pretty striking. But let me give you something that I think is a little bit more intuitive. Many of you are familiar with the classification of species. This was first introduced by Linnaeus back in 1735 in a, in a sort of comprehensive way. There's a dog. Everybody knows your dogs. A dog is an animal. It's not a plant. It's not a fungus. <laughs> it's a vertebrate. It has a backbone. It's a mammal. Hairy. gives milk to its offspring. And it's a canine, as you can see by like, its facial appearance. Right? That's intuitive. There's a fox. A fox is also an animal, also a vertebrate, still has a backbone. Still a mammal, still hairy and nurses its young, and it's canine still. Cat. Cat, again, still animal, vertebrate, and mammal, but now we've changed the appearance a little bit. It's not a canine. There's a seagull, animal and vertebrate, but nope, it's not hairy and doesn't give milk to its offspring. There's a fly, which is, obviously does not have a backbone. So you see, like, this is pretty straightforward. Now, what Linnaeus did not discuss, but is an insight that came after that, and this is something that Darwin extrapolated on quite a bit, is this classification tends to reflect shared ancestry. So those species which share many of those same classifications tend to have a recent common ancestor. So for example, if you go back, dog and fox have a very recent common ancestor. Go further back, dog and cat. Way further back, dog and seagull share a common ancestor, it'll be right there. And way, way far back, dog and fly share a common ancestor. Way far back there. So it's hard to conceive of these hundreds of millions of years as depicted here, but let me show you something that you may be able to see from your own families. This is shared ancestry on a much shorter time frame, right? So obviously, you know, you and your sibling share common ancestors with your parents. Generally speaking, people look a lot more like their siblings than they do like their cousins. Again, it's the same principle for the same reason, that individuals with the most recent shared ancestors share the most traits. You see this in the, in the broad tree of life, just like you see it in your own family tree. Again, generally speaking, people, siblings more like, look more like each other than cousins. First cousins look more like each other than second cousins. So basically, we, this applies through all of life, and the classification that Linnaeus introduced back in 1735 for the first time still holds today across many, many more traits, but strikingly, not just traits, but even in the genetic code. This is a small stretch of the cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1 gene. And if you look there, dog and fox are absolutely identical in sequence. Dog and cat differ just in those last two DNA bits. Dog and gull differ in three. Dog and fly differ in six you see that same hierarchical nature in all of life. And that's very, very striking. And of course, when people talk about the evidence for evolution, they don't usually go into this sort of thing. You more look at uh, things like, the, you hear about things like the fossil record. The fossil record is phenomenal. It is so much better than, than it potentially could have been. What this shows here on, on the slide is the origin of birds from dinosaurs on the left, the origin of cetaceans, things like dolphins and, um, and whales and porpoises on the right. And there's many, many, many transitional forms that have been very well described. This was not true, say, like 100 years ago, but now the fossil record is very, very good. Clear transitional forms are apparent. So what I want to do now is I want to address a couple of common misconceptions about evolution before we go into processes and then back to Star Trek at last. So one common misconception comes from this figure, which is very unfortunate. It's depicted all the time, which makes it look like humans came from chimps in some way. right? That is absolutely not the case. That, again, humans share a common ancestor with chimps. Humans did not evolve from chimps. Just in the same way, you are not a descendant of your brother or your cousin, but you share common ancestors with your brother and your cousin. Okay? So this is a common misconception with, reg with regard to evolution. Here's another one as depicted in a Star Trek episode. I'm going to play a little clip. Yeah, so this is another common misconception, this idea of less evolved or below, more evolved or above. All of life on Earth has been evolving for those four billion years. Chimps have continued to evolve, bacteria continue to evolve. The amoeba, the amoeba is fantastic. It's a shapeshifter. <laughs> I can't shapeshift. 
It's, been, it's acquired that over time. If you put an amoeba in really bad conditions, it'll form this hardened cyst and it'll survive for a really long time. Put me in really bad conditions, I just die, right? So, I mean, everything has been evolving for the same amount of time. There's no above, below, more evolved, less evolved. It's not true. So why might, coming back now to some evolutionary processes, why might extraterrestrial life look similar to life on Earth? Well, one possible example that people would toss out is something having to do with natural selection. Can natural selection cause you to look more similar? So a couple of quick principles first. Generally speaking, we tend to see more evolutionary change. Remember, evolution just means change over time. We tend to see more evolutionary change when populations are isolated for a long time. So I have a, like some, just some random pictures here. I have some Galapagos land iguanas and the dragon's blood tree. Those are crazy looking things that are found in very isolated populations very far away from others. What happens on those populations is different mutations arrive, or you know, they, mo they mostly pop up, and then different environmental pressures drive what happens to those mutations. So let's talk about how natural selection happens. I'm gonna use a fictional example here. It's not completely fictional, but it's, it's cari uh, caricatured. That's the word I was thinking. Imagine a long time ago, a brown bear makes its way up to a very you know, icy, snowy area. So that brown bear is very conspicuous. It starts chasing, you know, I don't know what they eat, seals or something like that. It starts chasing some seals. Seals can see it from a mile away, right? Let's imagine a random mutation pops up in this brown bear lineage such that one of its kids is white. It's like an albino bear. It's now much harder to see. It's able to get a lot more of those seals because it gets more seals, it has more food. Because it has more food, it has more kids. And that mutation then is given to more offspring. That is evolution by natural selection. And importantly, this is not just a theory in the sense that we don't understand it. Natural selection is in fact a mathematical inevitability. Now I want to show you why that's true in just a second. Now we can apply this to bears, we can apply it to ear shape, but let's just do bears for right now. Imagine in this hypothetical scenario for the brown bear that goes to the, the snowy area versus the white bear. Let's say you started with a population that's half, half brown, half white. Let's pretend for now they're just, they're, they're, they just reproduce by budding or something like that. We're not going to put in the sex parts. So imagine that the brown bears have on average one kid. The white bears have on average two kids. And the next generation, assuming the parents have died, we've gone from, again, we've just replaced the brown bears with another set of brown bears. We have twice as many white bears. Right? So we've gone from 50% to 66%. If you iterate this, you go 80%, 89%, eventually the whole population will be white bears. There's nothing controversial in this. It is a mathematical inevitability if you have three conditions met. You have heritability, you have variation, and that variation affects survival or reproduction. That will inevitably always happen. Now what natural selection can sometimes do is it can cause convergence or cause things to start looking similar in form. So distantly related species can sometimes evolve some similarity. So for example, if you look at sharks and porpoises, they kind of have similar body shape, right? If you look at, say, the puffin and penguin, you know, one from the North Pole, one from the South Pole, again, you see the sort of black back, the white bottom. You know, again, you can get some sort of similarities. Importantly, they're not identical. And th these differences become much more apparent when you look more closely. Let's use the shark and dolphin as an example. So looking a lot more closely at these, they do differ in color. Now the dolphin nurses its young, again, it's a mammal, it has bones like ours, it has lungs, and it's warm-blooded. The shark has bones made of cartilage, it does not nurse, it has gills, and it's cold-blooded. They're really radically different. All that has converged is just their overall body shape. All that's converged is the part that was relevant to that environment. Okay? Now, what about Star Trek? There's a lot of species that look really, really, really similar. <laughs> Slight differences in forehead shape, ears, color, maybe having antennae. Uh, arguably, you could say maybe this is a little bit too similar. So this is something that came up and the Star Trek writers were familiar with it. So they put out three hypotheses for why you might see this. And these are from different, uh, different episodes. Intriguingly, they never actually connected the episodes to each other, but you know, we'll set that aside. So let's go over these three hypotheses. What I'll do for each one is we'll watch a clip from Star Trek that introduces the hypothesis. I'll break down some of the predictions and we'll assess how likely they are. Let me say ahead of time, one of these is actually okay. Not terrible. <laughs> one of these is okay. Two are really not okay. <laughs> so for this first one, just for context, what's happened is a whole bunch of different species have arrived on this planet. 
They were trying to solve some sort of puzzle. There was, there was something that was in their DNA code they put together and it suddenly creates a hologram to appear. Kind of a weird setup, but we'll leave it at that. This is about a minute long clip. So, the idea here is something about life evolving earlier. Some people, uh, I don't know what to call them, dough faces or whatever, we'll say that they went around and they seeded life on all these other worlds. In an earlier part of the episode, which you didn't see, they actually mentioned specifically this was around four billion years ago too. So, okay, there's something to this. So let's break this down. First, the possibility that raw materials for life came from outer space. They're a little vague what exactly those raw materials were. Um, the second, this convergence of life seeded elsewhere at the same time. And the third, the persistence of these quote unquote seed codes over that long. So the first of these hypotheses is what's often referred to as panspermia. And this is something that it could very well be true that maybe the raw materials for life did come from outer space. They were correct in the earlier part of the episode where they mentioned life started around four billion years ago. There is strong evidence for extraterrestrially formed amino acids and some components of DNA and RNA have come from meteorites. Yeah, it, like it says there, in principle there's no reason life on Earth may not have come from outer space in some way or been seeded in some way by something that came from outer space. The second one gets a little bit more problematic. This is this idea of convergence with life seeded elsewhere in time. Uh, that one's a tough one. <laughs> so even if you're assuming there's a lot of natural selection for conversions, like what we were talking about with conversion evolution, the conditions would have to be very similar at the end, but even then, that's not good enough. So Stephen Jay Gould, who this prize is, is honoring, had an interesting thought experiment he laid out in one of his books, which is like, what would happen if you took the tape of life, rewound it, and played it again? Would you get the same outcome? The answer to that would have to be no if the role of chance events is very large. Whereas if chance events don't play much role, then yeah, sure, maybe you get exactly the same thing. Now in terms of humanoids, we know that chance events, especially over that time scale, played a dramatic role in life. I'm just gonna give you two examples. One of them, the, one of them is this, what is this? The mitochondria, the mitochondria, not biologists, the rest of you in the room, what is the mitochondria? Powerhouse of the cell. That, I think, is the most successful thing that all of high school biology teaches everybody, because everybody knows that. <laughs> so, about two billion years ago, a single-celled organism swallowed a bacterium. That bacterium survived inside it and had the machinery to provide energy to the larger single-celled organism. This helped it reproduce, and the bacteria reproduced inside it, and that is what eventually became the mitochondria. This played a massive role in the emergence of animals, plants, fungi, and generally multicellular species. I'll show you where that was on the evolutionary tree in just a second. There's another thing, if you go back a little bit more recently, 65 million years ago, on Earth we had a lot of volcanic activity, and we also had a big asteroid <laughs> crashed into North America. That had a massive effect on life on Earth. It knocked back the dinosaurs in a big way, and because of that, those little mammals that were hiding in terror, <laughs> they were able to radiate, and you see the emergence of much larger mammals than, than were present before that. So let's go back to this tree of life that I showed earlier. So again, like, the origin of all life is somewhere like 3.84 billion years ago. So let's zoom in on the two events I mentioned. So it's, it's sort of drawn on here, I'll, I'll point out. You can just follow this as an arc. So this is where the, the volcanic activity as well as the asteroid hit happen. And you see, starting right around there, there's a massive emergence of a lot of these brown branches, which is the emergence of a lot of mammal, rate, uh, a lot of mammal species. So that's pretty striking. Let's go back to the mitochondria. That's right around there, about two billion years ago. And you see this emergence of all of these, the fungi, the, fungi, the um, plants, the animals, four billion years ago. So, if this were true, we can go back all the way to four billion years ago and that's where you share a common ancestor with all these humanoid alien species. You are literally more closely related to grass than you are to a Vulcan. That's pretty problematic. So how would this happen? Well, here's the, here's the doe faces. They're, they're planting you know, seeds of life everywhere. Maybe they're aiming asteroids to all these planets to knock back the reptiles. Not sure what's happening. And somehow after that, we still get all these forms which are pretty darn similar. 
I have to say that's a no. Put an X on that one. Also, what happened there, they said they have this, this seed code that was left there, which let's assume that the seed code is in the DNA sequence. I know that's an assumption they didn't say that, but let's assume that. We can actually mathematically test that step. So over those four billion years, we expect some random mutations to disrupt this code, right? <laughs> so think back, like, okay, we'll just, we're not even gonna take the whole length of time. Let's use, just use the first one and a half billion years as a microbe. Let's assume something like 100 cell divisions per year. Let's assume a pretty low mutation rate. What is the probability that any one DNA element in there would not change over that one and a half billion years? Well, mathematically, that'd be about one in three million, or about half the probability that a specific one of you would be hit by a meteor. Pretty darn unlikely, or watch out when you go out of this room. So in terms of this first hypothesis, this idea that raw materials for life came out of space, maybe. Convergence with life seeded elsewhere at the same time, not on that time scale, no way. No way would you get something that similar after four billion years of independent evolution. And probably with the assumptions I had, you probably wouldn't have the persistence of the seed codes over time. So we have to put an X on this one. So let's look for the second explanation. This one's now from the original series. So this is now the 60, 1960 Star Trek rather than 1990 Star Trek. So they've shown up on this planet. They were called down by some weird gl glowing ball. <laughs> Sorry, my descriptions are pretty awful. <laughs> So, it is possible that you are our descendants 6,000 centuries ago. Their vessels were colonizing the galaxy and maybe Adam and Eve or whoever, like two ancient humans were two of their travelers. So let's break this down again, three predictions. So the first one is that Earth was visited by alien forms a very, very, very long time ago. We have no way of testing that, so I'm just gonna put a check by it, like, okay, I guess. <laughs> There's no way to know that one. <laughs> The second is that this happened something around 600,000 years ago, and they were humanoid, and then they, you know, would they continue to evolve to look similar to us over that time? And the last part is that modern humans descend from these spacefarers. So let's go back to 600,000 years ago. Yeah, there were some other hominids here on Earth, so this coincides with, for just as one example, Homo erectus being on Earth. Homo erectus doesn't look exactly like us, but it's pretty similar. So you can imagine maybe space travelers that came to Earth evolved to, from the Homo erectus-like form to the modern human form, but maybe on Vulcan they evolved the pointy ears and Romulus also pointy ears. You get a couple of these other changes. Couldn't say no, it could have happened. The problem's the third one. Who do we descend from? And this was pointed out by Dr. Anne Mulhall in that episode that you just saw. This assumes we are not related to chimps, gorillas, or any other life on Earth. As I said earlier, there's a ton, ton of DNA evidence that suggests we are related. And importantly, there's a fossil record on Earth, right? And this goes back well before 600,000 years ago. So we know that evolution happened on Earth. It didn't happen someplace else. So unfortunately, this one doesn't really fly either. I mean, maybe Earth was visited by alien forms. Yes, you could get some of the changes like about on the scale of what you see with the other species over 600,000 years and that you'd see humanoids, but this idea that modern humans descend from these spacefarers and other species don't, no. So, should I skip ahead? Here's a, here's a last one. This last one, the context for this one's a little bit funny. Not that they are, others aren't. <laughs> they show up at a, the ship shows up at a planet, they, they go down and they see trees everywhere and they, and they find a group of Native Americans. That's kind of out there. <laughs> Um, there's also a big obelisk there, which they were trying to study, and that's what Spock is about to comment on here. So this is kind of the opposite of the previous one. In this case, rather than saying that humanoids came to Earth and then, and then continued to evolve, now we're saying that, in this case, the preservers came from the galaxy, they presumably came to Earth, they found, in this case, Native Americans and said, we're gonna take them and put them someplace else. So when we break this down, there's first the question whether some life on Earth went into space. There's the second of the timing, I'm gonna play with that a little bit. And the third is that modern aliens descend from ancient Earth hominids. This is the last of the hypotheses that's put out there. 
The first one, this is one of the few cases, this is the first one is unambiguously true, that some Earth life went to other planets. So we know this in the context, for example, recently of human space probes. NASA generally has a goal of trying to decontaminate Earth life, like spores and things like that, from uh, spaceships before we send them up into space, but there's never a goal of 100% decontamination. So just on the Mars Curiosity rover, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of spores on the flight system and tens of thousands on the hardware surfaces. It's possible that a small number might survive a transit going to another planet. Not, you know, it would be tough, but it's possible. It's, there's also, this also may have happened accidentally. We talked earlier about the asteroid impact on Earth. When that happened, boom, it probably knocked huge rocks off into space. It's possible some like microbes or some spores were like kept inside one of these rocks and, uh, and pretty safe in transit over to say Mars or something like that. In fact, NASA, I don't know if you guys know, so back on the first point, NASA actually has a committee on, committee on space research panel on planetary protection. And they recently actually hired a new officer for that. Wouldn't that be the coolest job in the world? I'm the officer of planetary protection. <laughs> it's a real job. So anyway, this part, yeah, probably some life on Earth may well have gone to other planets and may have even lived too. I'm going to change the Native American part and let's make it back like the previous one. Let's say, what if it went 600,000 years ago coinciding with ancient hominids? Yeah, okay. Over that time, you might have some change in form, get like the pointy ears, get the, the weird foreheads. Of course, the, the challenge is the last point that's up there. The, the, you can't just take people and drop them off on Mars or something like that. You need all the other sustaining life forms like the plants and microbes and stuff like that. The last one. Modern aliens descend from these hominids. Now again, like I said, you could expect some change over something like 600,000 years, but there's a testable prediction here that humanoids should be more similar to each other, so like us and Vulcan, Klingon, all those things, should be more similar to each other than any of us are to chimpanzee. So there's some actual DNA sequence from human, Cardassian, and... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Hypothetically, though, you might see something like this. So I have uh, human, two alien species, and chimp, and we see... All the humanoids are fairly similar, but not identical, and chimp is more different. That would be pretty strong evidence that this life came from Earth and since the split of humans and chimps. And in fact, this is exactly the kind of approach that's used for inferring the direction of HIV transmission in criminal cases. So imagine now that you have two people, let's just call them John and Barb, they're both infected with HIV. You get a bunch of little HIV uh, isolates from each individual, and you make this tree of relationships using the DNA sequences from them. With this particular one, what you see is all of Barb's are clustered inside the broader group of John's. What this would say, what this would show, is that it's much more likely that John infected Barb than Barb infected John. We can use the same logic for Earth to other versus other to Earth. And here we have, as you can see, the human and all these other humanoids are clustered together, whereas all these other Earth species flank it. And again, this is the kind of thing that can be done fairly easily and is done easily all the time. So in terms of this last hypothesis, could some life on Earth have gone to outer space? Sure. I tweaked the timing just to cheat a little bit, but let's say it happened you know, a couple hundred thousand years ago, sure. And do modern aliens descend from ancient Earthlings? Well, we can't prove that's wrong. So overall, this one, yeah, it could be okay. And of course, one of the biggest challenges will be moving all, enough other life, like the plants and microbes, and as well as finding a hospitable environment. You can't just drop people on Jupiter and they're okay. <laughs> so overall, what have we talked about? Wrapping this up. We have three hypotheses that came up from uh, Star Trek. One is this common origin of Earth and alien life dating back to four billion years ago. That got an X. Recent alien origin of some life on Earth, meaning it's unrelated to the rest of life on Earth. That got an X. But the recent Earth origin of some alien life, it's possible. So the answer to that big overarching question, could we see life as we know it elsewhere and how, is yes, if it came from Earth. <laughs> That's maybe not the most satisfying answer. It matches, maybe you're Ray Bradbury fans, it matches the last scene in the Martian Chronicles. But. So one thing I didn't talk about at all, and I just want to hit up here in the last couple of minutes is, what about all that interbreeding? You know, there's again all those, you know, human, Vulcan, human, Cardassian, whatever sort of hybrids out there. Well, if it came from Earth within the past 100,000 years, it's possible, and we know this because it happened among humanoids on Earth in the past 100,000 years. But in fact, modern humans, all of us here in this room, have some genes from ancient Neanderthal. It's a different species. 
Many humans have genes that from ancient Denisovan, another ancient humanoid. So for, for in terms of Neanderthal, I think, that, I think it runs something like one to 4% of our genome came from Neanderthal. If you're from European descent, you're much more Neanderthal. If you're, if you're African or Middle Eastern like me, you don't have so much, but you still have some. So there was this breeding, and in fact, just recently, there was a, what was it, a first generation human Denisovan hybrid was even found. That's pretty cool. So taking this back now, just taking a step out here, what are some of the lessons we discussed? We talked about common ancestry, how it's reflecting classification. We talked about some misconceptions of evolution. Natural selection, how it's a mathematical inevitability. Don't forget that. <laughs> we talked about convergence in evolution, chance in evolution. We've used some of these evolutionary trees. We talked about how life on Earth may have been seeded from space. Earth life forms may have gone to other planets. And we talked about humanoid interbreeding. That's a lot of science to extract in the context of Star Trek. So coming back to that, the broadest question that I introduced the whole thing with, again, science fiction is a set of hypotheses. And what's great about it that I find is that, you know, I love science fiction just intrinsically. And there's a lot of people who just love science intrinsically and they're, they're happy to go, you know, get a textbook and just start reading it. There's other people who can appreciate science, but they haven't had the right entry way for it. The idea from all this is to try to reach people in their interest areas. So I have a photo here from a 2017 class I did with my colleague, Professor Eric Spana, where as part one assignment in there, we went to the um, Duke Lemur Center and talked about the island of Madagascar and evolution on Madagascar. Then we also went and saw Kong Skull Island. And we had the students contrast Madagascar and Skull Island. And they, they learned a lot about island biogeography. They learned a ton of stuff. And they were really, really, really excited to do it. So that's really what we want to do. Again, a lot of people like science fiction. It's a great way to reach people. And I should emphasize, even within the evolution com community, it's not just me who does this. Here's one of my colleagues, Shane Campbell Staten from UCLA. He has this Biology of Superheroes podcast. Definitely encourage you to listen to it, especially if you're like a Marvel fan. You want to know how like Spider-Man works? Check out this podcast. It's really fun. Now, the last thing I'm going to say before I close out here is one of the nice things about Star Trek, in addition to it just being a wonderful series, in addition to it having a lot of science and attempts to do science well, is it's better than most TV in the context of showing diversity. So just, in, just showing a couple of the era-specific things. 1960s, one of the first depictions of an interracial kiss on American TV was in Star Trek. In the 1990s, we have both the female captain to the starship as well as the only male Asian regular on an on a American TV show. It's kind of shocking now when you think about that. And in the current series, Star Trek Discovery, we have you know, a relationship between two men here. And what I love about this relationship is it's not a plot point. Through the entire first series, there were just a couple of people who loved each other. It was never, ooh, they're gay. Oh, and it, was never a, it was never any discussion about it. It was just, here's two people who love each other. It's beautiful. So thank you all for coming. I know we're like just like four minutes before the start of the poster session. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plop down right over here. If anybody wants to have any questions, you can just come up and ask me. Everybody else, thank you for coming. And thank you for coming to the Evolution Conference.